Hazel, thanks very much for speaking to us. Um, I, just, I, I think this is your 18th year working at the Crucible. So uh, I just kind of, first of all, wanted to go back to the start and um, kind of what, what it was like working in snooker at the, at the beginning. I, I think you and Steve Davis and John Parrott started at a very similar time. So yes. what was that like for the kind of the three of you? Yeah, we did. Well, we started um, in season 2001-2 together. Our first was the LG Cup in Preston. And um, they hadn't done a huge amount of telly and I hadn't done a huge amount of snooker. So we were all rookies together in that regard. But uh, they were very generous and uh, taught me some of the nuances of their sport. And hopefully I passed on a few of the nuances of broadcasting and we sort of muddled our way through from there and we've remained um, I think a real lovely team since then and uh, I'm really lucky because it's very seldom that you get uh, to work with people again and again and again and they become friends as well as colleagues and, uh, and they really are. Um, I've worked on a huge number of sports over the years uh, but this one there is definitely a family feel to it and there's a huge seriousness and a professionalism about what goes on, but I think there's also an appreciation that it is one of the hardest, hardest sports to be brilliant at. Because if the other fellow's playing well, you don't get a shot. You have to sit there and suffer. And I think it's one of the most psychologically brutal sports I've ever worked upon. I worked a lot in golf over the years as well, but you are very much in charge of your own destiny there. Some of the, the cliff edge psychological drama that I've witnessed, I, I think will remain with me forever. It's some of the best sport I've ever seen. Can you give us just some idea of how much preparation you do for, for, for this event? A lot, yeah. Um, I, I'm one of the uh, one of the anoraks, the sporting anoraks, I suppose, in, in uh, as a broadcaster, always have been. Uh, but that has always, for me, been part of the, the interest and the thrill of it and turning up a few interesting lines and uh, comparing and contrasting and having done a, a lot of the work beforehand and then obviously scrapping to try and memorise as much as you can and have that information at your fingertips. It's something that I've had to do in golf. I think whilst you can, you can know a little bit about a lot of players, some of whom will never feature towards the, the tail end of a major, here you have a very small, much smaller group so your level of knowledge and your level of interest and the depth of your search has to be that much deeper because you have to find so many more things to talk about in a, in a, in a, in a two-day match, for example. So, yeah, the level of it is deeper, but therefore I think all the more um, intriguing. And um, obviously given the amount of time you've been working in the sport, you've had a whole range of different sorts of interviews to do, some kind of tricky, some very memorable, and one that always kind of sticks to mind is that, that one with Peter Ebden <laughs> after his extraordinary match with Ronnie O'Sullivan. Yeah. In those sorts of situations, does your kind of background as a journalist and as a, as a presenter, does your kind of journalistic background kick in and, and kind of help you? I hope so. I hope so. I'd like to think it does. Uh, because clearly you're juggling a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of information flying around about what's available to us. Is Ronnie going to the press conference? Are we going to take that live? So you're actually listening to two or three voices um, and you are steering the broadcast. Um, clearly there's a lot of editorial um, necessity upon me uh, to be able to, to go where I want to go. Are there any interviews that you've done in particular that kind of stick out for you? I think, I think the Ebden one sticks out, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was an extraordinary event that night. Uh, everything was going on, Ronnie had been knocked out. Um, so that, that was tumultuous. Ronnie comes forward to shake his hand, a truly amazing quarterfinal. But I think also one of the most memorable and probably the most enjoyable was um, was speaking to Mark uh, Williams last year um, after that incredible final and the whole family being out there. I think we owe a debt of gratitude to the lady that's on the screen now, Jo, your wife. She was the lady. Here she comes. Come on in, Jo, because you are the one who persuaded this man not to hang up the queue but to keep going last year. And this is a family snap for the album here. What would you like to say to this woman, the woman who kept you going? Uh -huh, yeah, she convinced me. Last year I was seriously thinking about giving up and she, uh, she basically said I can't stick when I was 24 hours a day, so. <laughs> that was a, a joyous moment and I think everybody felt so lifted by what they'd seen. That'll stick with me for a long time, yeah. One of the most poignant ones was, was watching Ken Doherty's comeback. Um, in 2003 against Paul Hunter in the semi-final. Paul looked like he was going to march on into his, his first final. It didn't happen. Doherty was unbelievable that year to get into the final against uh, 
against Mark Williams and nearly caught him on the line as well. And of course, that was that was Paul's last opportunity to to become a world champion. An absolutely unbelievable afternoon, and Paul Hunter summons a gracious smile despite his crushing sense of disappointment. There's so many moments in this little theatre that will always stay with you, and um, you sometimes, you sometimes when I'm when I'm picturing coming back here, I can almost hear it, I can almost feel it, I can almost smell it. And I know what I'm coming to here because it never changes and it's always different. And that is the enduring appeal of this amazing place.